Welcome you are about to heed all about the photos and the captions, from 12-01 to 12-30. Of the chapter 12 synthesis from the book Understanding Movies. Starting on page 491. 12 to 1 publicity photo of Orson Welles and cinematographer Greg. Tolan during the production of Citizen Kane, U.S.A., 1941. Toland, the most admired cinematographer of his generation, asked Wells if he could photograph the young director's first feature film. He was fascinated by Wells's bold theatricality, and he often suggested more effective ways of shooting scenes. They discussed each shot in the movie which is eclectic in its visual style, integrating a variety of influences. Wells was strongly drawn to the lighting. Theories of such theatrical designers as Gordon Craig and Adolf Appia and to many of the techniques of the German Expressionist movement. Wells was also influenced by the moody Loki photography of John Ford's stagecoach. Wells was so grateful for the help of the veteran cinematographer that he gave Toland a conspicuous credit title, unusual in this era. 12 to 2 Citizen Kane. Kane ushered in an era of flamboyant visual effects in the American cinema, and as such, represented an assault on the classical ideal of an invisible style. Lights are often from below or other unexpected sources, creating startling clashes and abstract patterns and infusing the photographed materials with a sense of visual exuberance. There's nothing invisible about the lighting of this shot, for example. As written, the scene is merely exposition, setting up the movie's narrative premise. Some reporters are talking in a screening room, and while they talk, the light from the projection booth splashes into the darkened auditorium, flooding the silhouetted figures in a sea of undulating luminescence. 12 to 3 Citizen Kane with Orson Welles and, at far end of the table, Everett Sloan and Joseph Cotton. Welles's deep focus photography is meant to be admired for its virtuosity as well as its functionalism. Andre Bazan, an enthusiastic champion of deep focus techniques, believed that it reduces the importance of editing and preserves the cohesiveness of real space and time. Many spatial planes can be captured simultaneously in a single take, maintaining the objectivity of a scene. Bazan felt that audiences were thus encouraged to be more creative, less passive, in understanding the relationships between people and things. In this photo, for example, we are free to look at the faces of over two dozen characters. The public may choose, with its eyes, what it wants to see of. A shot, Wells said. I don't like to force it. 12 to 4 Citizen Kane with Ray Collins. RKO's highly respected special effects department consisted of 35 people, most of whom worked on Kane. Vernon L. Walker was in charge. Over 80% of the movie required some kind of special effects work, such as miniatures, matte shots, and double and multiple exposures. Many scenes required reprinting, that is, combining two or more separate images onto one through the use of the optical printer. For example, this shot combines three separately photographed images, Boss Jim Geddes, Collins, standing on a balcony overlooking Madison Square Garden, with Kane down below delivering a campaign speech to a huge audience. The frame of the balcony masks the dividing line between the two areas. The auditorium area combines live action, stage, with the matte painting, audience, the balcony set consists of two walls. Wells was thus able to give the movie an epic scope, while keeping production costs relatively low. Total cost of the picture, just under $700,000, not lavish by the standards of 1941. 12 to 5 Citizen Kane with Harry Shannon, Buddy Swan, in window, George Coolery's, and Agnes Moorhead. 
Almost all of the compositions in Kane are intricate and richly textured, at times baroquely ornate. But the visual complexity is not mere rhetorical ornamentation. The images are designed to reveal a maximum of information, often in an ironic manner. In this scene, for example, eight-year-old Charles plays with his sled outside in the snow while his future is being determined indoors by his mother and Thatcher. The boy's father watches impotently, sputtering a few feeble protests. The mise-en-scene is compartmentalized into twos, Kane Sr. and young Charles are grouped to the left of the frame. Thatcher and the severe Mrs. Kane dominate the right poise to sign the contract that will soon separate Charles from his parents. Ironically, Mrs. Kane is motivated by love and self-sacrifice. She is sending Charles away to protect him from his father, a swaggering lout whose treatment of his son veers from forced jocularity to unpredictable outbursts of anger. 12 to 6 Citizen Kane with Dorothy Cumminger, at lower left base of fireplace, and Orson Welles. In scenes depicting Kane as an old man, the camera is often far away, making him seem remote, inaccessible. Even when he is closer to the lens, as in this shot, the deep focus photography keeps the rest of the world at a distance, with vast empty spaces between him and other people. We are often forced to search the mise en scène to locate the characters. In this photo, for example, Susan is dwarfed into insignificance by the enormous fireplace and the heroic sculpture behind her. She is a mere subsidiary contrast, not even so important as the statuary and much less important than the dominant, Kane. These static shots are so totally drained of intimacy and spontaneity that they're almost funny, if they weren't so sad. 12 to 7 Citizen Kane In many respects, Kane is structured like a mystery story, a search to penetrate a great enigma. Wells is able to suggest this idea in the very opening sequence, through a series of dissolves and traveling shots. The movie begins with a sign, no trespassing. Ignoring it, the camera cranes up over the sign and over a wire fence. We dissolve from an ornate grillwork to an iron gate showing the letter K. Xanadu is in the background, suffocating in mist and darkness. Here lies the mystery. Here the search begins. 12 to 8 Citizen Kane with Everett Sloan, Orson Welles, and Joseph Cotton. As a young man, Kane is a dynamo of energy, and his youthful high spirits are often conveyed kinetically with brisk traveling shots that parallel the protagonist's movements. In this scene, for example, he comically lurches forward and backward, then forward again, the camera retreating and lunging back with him, as he nervously tries to announce his engagement to Emily Norton. 12-9 Citizen Kane with George Coolerys, Orson Welles, and Everett Sloan. Welles frequently used lengthy takes in his staging, choreographing the movements of the camera and the characters rather than cutting to a series of separate shots. Even in relatively static scenes such as this, these lengthy takes provide the mise-en-scene with a sense of fluidity and dynamic change, while still entrapping the three characters within the same space. The setting is a large office in 1929. The Great Depression has dealt Kane a severe setback, forcing him to relinquish control over his publishing empire. The sequence begins with a close shot of a legal document, while off-camera Bernstein recites its contents. He lowers the document, thus revealing Thatcher now an old man, presiding over the dissolution. The camera adjusts slightly, and we then see Kane, listening grimly. 12 to 10 Citizen Kane with Orson Welles and Ruth Warwick Welles often combine editing with another technique, which he used as a payoff. In the famous breakfast montage sequence portraying the disintegration of Kane's marriage to Emily, for example, he concluded with this final shot. The distance between the two says it all, they have nothing to say to each other. Notice how the arches in the ceiling reinforce their separate worlds. 12 to 11 Citizen Kane with Orson Welles. Budgetary considerations often determined the cunning editing strategies of the film, which was edited by Robert Wise. In the political campaign sequence, for example, Welles cut from long shots of Kane delivering his speech to closer shots of his family and associates listening in the audience. These isolated fragments are intercut with re-establishing shots of the entire auditorium. See 12 to 4. The huge hall and its thousands of inhabitants weren't real, the cutting makes them seem real, by association. 12 to 12 Publicity photo of Orson Welles and composer-conductor Bernard Herrmann during a recording session for Citizen Kane. Herrmann was the composer for Welles's Mercury Theater of the Air, and when Welles went to Hollywood, he took Herrmann with him. Citizen Kane was his first movie score. The two worked closely together, 
Wells often cutting his film to accommodate the musical numbers, rather than vice versa, which was usually the case in Hollywood. Herman was present throughout the production, taking 12 weeks to compose the score, an unusually lengthy period of time. Difficult, intensely egotistical, an uncompromising perfectionist, Herman did most of his best work for Wells and Alfred Hitchcock, including the scores for The Magnificent Ambersons, Vertigo, North by Northwest, Psycho, and many others. 12 to 13 Citizen Kane with Dorothy Cummingor. Kane demonstrates that virtually every kind of visual has its oral counterpart. This montage sequence is reinforced by an oral montage of Susan Alexander's shrieking arias, orchestral music, popping flashbulbs, and the percussive sounds of newspaper presses rolling. The pounding sounds are machine like and inexorable, battering their sacrificial victim until she is stupefied by terror and exhaustion. 12 to 14 Citizen Kane with Dorothy Cummingor. Cummingor's brilliant performance as Susan provides considerable warmth to an otherwise cold and intellectual film. The few close ups in the movie are reserved primarily for her forcing us to become more involved with Susan's feelings. Like most of the major characters, she's a study in contradiction, screechy and pitiful at the same time. She can also be very funny. A person can go crazy in this dump, she complains in her typical whining monotone. Nobody to talk to, nobody to have any fun with. 49,000 acres of nothing but scenery and statues. 12 to 15 artists rendering of the interior set of Xanadu for Citizen Kane. In the area of set design and decor, Wells was fortunate in his choice of studio, for RKO's art director, Van Nest Polblis, was among the best in the industry. Perry Ferguson, who actually designed the sets under Polblis's general supervision, shared his boss's preference for monumental sets with unusual sources of lighting and richly textured details. 12 to 16 exterior set of Xanadu for Citizen Kane. The mist shrouded tropic setting groans under the weight of the sprawling, towering Xanadu, unfinished and already beginning to decay, like a rotting mausoleum from the pages of Edgar Allan Poe. Although the palm trees sway as the wisps of fog drift past dreamily, the set was actually a matte painting, only a few feet high. Compared to today's far more realistic special effects, Shots like these look dated, almost quaint. In 1941, they were convincing facsimiles of the real thing. 12 to 17 three photos of Orson Welles as Charles Foster Kane at various periods in his life. Welles was required to age about 50 years during the course of the story. Thanks in part to the makeup artistry of Maurice Siderman. Welles is completely convincing whether playing Kane at 25, A, 45, B, or 75, C. As Kane grows older, his hair grays and recedes, his jowls sag, his cheeks grow puffier, and the bags beneath his eyes grow more pouchy. Siderman also created a synthetic rubber body suit to suggest the increasingly flabby torso of an older man. 12 to 18 publicity photo of Dorothy coming or an opera costume for Citizen Kane. Bernard Herman composed the film's opera, Salambo, in the style of 19th century French Oriental operas. Edward Stevenson's costumes are in this same campy style of mockery. For example, Susan's outlandish regalia is a send-up of what the well-dressed French Oriental opera queen might wear while suffering the agonies of unrequited love, torment, and despair. 12 to 19 Citizen Kane globe like a number of Wells's other movies, Kane begins with the end, the death of its protagonist when he is about 75. In his final moments of life, the old man holds a small crystal ball containing a miniature scene that flurries with artificial snow when shaken. With his last dying breath, he utters the word Rosebud. Then the glass ball crashes to the floor, splintering into a thousand fragments. The plot of the movie is structured like a search, for the meaning of this final utterance. 12 to 20 approximate proportion of each plot unit in Citizen Kane. Many critics have marveled at the intricate, jigsaw puzzle structure of the movie, with its interlocking pieces that don't click together until the final scene. 
The following plot outline sets forth the main structural units of the film and the principal characters and events of each. 1. Prologue. Xanadu. Kane's death. Rosebud. 2. Newsreel. Death of Kane. Enormous wealth and decadent lifestyle. Contradictory political image. Marriage to Emily Norton. Exposé of Love Nest. Divorce. Marriage to Susan Alexander, singer. Political campaign. Opera career. The Great Depression and Kane's financial decline. Lonely, secluded old age and Xanadu. 3. Premise. Thompson is instructed by his editor, 12 to 2, to discover the mystery of Rosebud by questioning Kane's former associates. It will probably be a very simple thing. False step, Susan refuses to speak to Thompson. 4. Flashback, The Memoirs of Walter P. Thatcher. Kane's Childhood. Thatcher becomes Guardian. Kane's first newspaper, The Inquirer. Introduction of Bernstein and Leland. Newspaper Crusading Years. Kane's financial decline in the 1930s. 5. Flashback, Bernstein. Early Days at the Inquirer. Declaration of Principles. Building a Publishing Empire. Engagement to Emily Norton. 6. Flashback, Jed Leland. Disintegration of Marriage to Emily. Kane Meets Susan. Political Campaign in 1918. Exposé, Divorce, Remarriage. Susan's Opera Career. Final Break Between Kane and Jed. 7. Flashback, Susan Alexander Kane. Opera Debut and Career. Suicide Attempt. Years of Semi-Seclusion with Kane at Xanadu. Susan Leaves Kane. 8. Flashback, Raymond, Butler at Xanadu. Kane's Final Days. Rosebud. 9. Coda. Revelation of Rosebud. Reverse of Opening Prologue, Producing Closure. 10. Cast and Credits. 12-21 Production Photo of Orson Welles, in middle-aged makeup, and Greg Toland lining up a shot for the post-election scene between Kane and Jed Leland. Wells used low-angle shots as a motif. Throughout the picture, especially to emphasize the awesome power of the protagonist. In this scene, the angle is so low that the floorboards of the set had to be torn away to allow for the camera's placement. Combined with the perspective distorting wide angle lens, such low angle shots portray Kane as a towering colossus, capable of crushing anything that gets in his way. 12 to 22 Citizen Kane with William Olland and Paul Stewart. Near the end of the movie, Thompson, Olland, admits defeat. He never does find out what Rosebud means, and he describes his investigation as playing with a jigsaw puzzle, while the camera cranes back and up, further and further away revealing thousands of crates of artwork, memorabilia, and personal effects, the fragmented artifacts of a person's life. I don't think any word can explain a man's life, Thompson continues. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle, a missing piece. 12-23 Citizen Kane with Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. Jed Leland, Cotton, represents the moral conscience of the film, Kane's idealistic alter ego. Roles like this are difficult to play well, because they can easily degenerate into sentimental cliches of piety. Cotton toughens up the role by refusing to make Leland too likable. Although sensitive and intelligent, Leland is also a bit of a prig, a New England schoolmarm, to use his own phrase. Like Bernstein, he loves Kane and is loyal to him when they are all young and committed to social reform. But when he finally recognizes Kane's ego for the destructive force it is, Jed pulls back, disillusioned. 12-24 Citizen Kane with Joseph Cotton and Everett Sloan Kane's rampant consumerism is best illustrated by his mania for collecting European art treasures. Not because he enjoys art, indeed, he scarcely ever mentions it, but because of its value as a status symbol. His conspicuous consumption becomes a habit rather than a passionate interest. After a while, no one even bothers to uncrate his purchases, they're simply stored away with all his other possessions. 
12 to 25 promotional poster for Citizen Kane. Then as now, a studio's advertising emphasized a picture's commercial appeal. Then as now, sex and violence were the most common ploys to lure the mass audience. The promotional campaign for Citizen Kane was somewhat classier. It stressed Wells's box office appeal as the film's star and the controversy surrounding the picture's release. Posters and lobby displays also exaggerated the love angle, presumably to appeal to women patrons, I hate him. Susan proclaims. I love him. Emily counters. Neither statement is in the movie, of course, interestingly, this poster crudely parallels the multiple points of view found in the film itself. 12 to 26 The Magnificent Ambersons, U. S. A. 1942, with Dolores Castello, Agnes Moorhead, Joseph Cotton, and Ray Collins, directed by Orson Welles. Like most of Welles's movies, this, his favorite work, deals with the theme of a lost paradise. Unlike Kane, however, the tone is warm and nostalgic, the images more softly lyrical. Wells does not appear in the film, though he does narrate the story off-screen. He concludes with a shot of a microphone on a swinging boom, accompanied by a spoken credit, I wrote the picture and directed it. My name is Orson Wells. 12-27 Othello, Morocco, 1952, with Orson Wells and Suzanne Cloutier, directed by Wells. In 1948, Wells, discouraged by a string of box office failures, left for Europe and Africa, where he hoped to work as an independent producer-director. His first movie was this adaptation of Shakespeare. The project was a nightmare. It was over three years in the shooting, and Wells had to interrupt production many times to seek additional funding. He lost several players in the process. There were three Desdemonas, four Iagos. Sequences had to be reshot time and again. But finally the movie was finished. On the continent, it was enthusiastically praised and took the Grand Prix at the Cannes Film Festival. But British and American critics complained about its crude soundtrack. This was to be the pattern of virtually all his subsequent work outside America. 12-28 Touch of Evil 1958, with Orson Welles, directed by Welles. The gaudy, honky-tonk setting of this classic film noir is exaggerated by D. P. Russell Meddy's moody cinematography. Less compromised than most of. Wells's later works, the film is now considered a flawed masterpiece. When it was originally released, it took the Grand Prix at the Cannes Film Festival, where it created a sensation with audiences and critics. Wells was virtually deified by the French critical establishment, which almost routinely praised his films as the work of a master. In the United States, Touch of Evil failed at the box office. Most, American critics treated it as a cheap exploitation film. 12-29 The Trial, France-Italy-Slash. West Germany, 1962, with Anthony, Perkins, directed by Orson Welles. Welles took considerable liberties with Franz Kafka's famous novel, though he preserved its allegorical emphasis and its atmosphere of dread and paranoia. Its striking visual style is surrealistic, with bizarre landscapes, weird disjunctions in scale, and a rich symbolic texture. The plot is a virtual labyrinth, in which the terrified protagonist Perkins, stumbles from one disjointed location to another in an effort to exonerate himself from a nameless crime by nameless Accusers. In the United States, the movie was virtually ignored. 12 to 30 The Immortal Story, France, 1968, with Orson Welles, directed by Welles. I am one of those who plays kings, Welles once remarked. Jean Renoir said of him, when he steps before a camera, it is as if the rest of the world ceases to exist. He is a citizen of the screen. Wells exerts an immensely powerful presence on the screen, intimidating, mocking, theatrical. He is rarely at his best unless there is a larger-than-life quality to his role. Originally made for French television, this film barely caused a ripple in the country of his birth. He was far better known in America for his TV wine commercials. 
Thank you for watching. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel. Presented by the